Hello everyone, this is, uh, my name is Sam Cook, the uh, founder of Triathlon Research, and um, just trying to get everyone here, stand by, I just want to make sure everyone's unmuted here, because make sure that we can hear everyone, because um, I think we're having problems. Siri, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Marinda. Yep, I'm here and I can hear you. Okay, and Seton, are you there? Yes, sir. Okay, so, so forgive that quick technical. I just want to make sure everyone can hear before we we get started. And um, I'd like to welcome you to this very special edition uh, of Triathlon Research Live. And uh, I think, Siri, um, I don't know who's more popular, you or Marinda, but you guys have set a record for uh, over... 2,000 people uh, signed up for this event, so the, the triathlon research community really uh, is coming together for this one, so um, guys are a hot ticket. <laughs> it's definitely <laughs> Miranda. Definitely no, Miranda. We're, we're, we're a good team. We're a good team. We work well yeah. together. I actually think it's Seton Claggett, because everyone wants to see how big his beard has gotten, so. I think uh, so. Yes. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, to, Tonight, I just uh, I'm introducing uh, uh, Siri and Marinda uh, on this live event because what I'd like to do is is bring them together and talk about uh, first of all to just watch let everyone watch how uh, just an amazing athlete, a world champion athlete and coach interact. Uh, I, I got to see that firsthand with Gwen Jorgensen and Jamie Turner at the last camp in uh, Claremont, Florida, and. Uh, Luckily, we have the privilege of, of doing a camp with another world champion and, and her coach, also former world champion, Siri Lindley, um, at the uh, Boulder Camp coming up in, in Colorado in May. So I um, want to go over three things to really just educate the audience tonight. Is First of all, is the importance of setting goals and a season plan. Uh, the second thing I'd like to go over is execution of that plan and the uh, importance of how to execute. Um, and then finally, um, just going over racing in general and how to uh, work towards your final goal and, and how do you actually take a plan that you've executed and then implement it on race day. And then finally, I uh, just want to ask some deeper questions because Siri and, and Rinda are just uh, so, uh, they've just got a great philosophy and outlook on the sport and life in general. So. Uh, without further ado, um, I would just like to introduce everyone formally. Uh, Siri, uh, how are you doing? I'm doing great, and thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on here, and Rinia and I love having the chance to be able to hopefully help as many people as possible and share our experiences that we're really grateful for. Thank you, Siri. And uh, Rinda, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, as Siri said, we're excited to be able to um, spend a bit more time um, reaching out to the community, the greater triathlon community. And, um, this was just an awesome opportunity for us to be able to help out a lot of triathletes, hopefully, um, along the way. Yeah, and, and the thing that struck me, Brenda and Siri, just spending the last week uh, visiting with you guys is how incredibly busy you are. And uh, for any of you who have wondered why you haven't seen more of Siri and Brenda, it's just they're, they're busy winning world championships. So... Uh, <laughs> uh, we're just lucky to get them on, and, and um, you know, I know that they're very anxious to give back to the community. And uh, finally, Seton, um, Seton Claggett, the founder of Tri Sports and our uh, great uh, enduring sponsor of this show and our, our camp series. Uh, welcome, Seton. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. When I saw when I saw this was coming out, I was going to watch anyway. So now I get to I get to be in it and watch. So I'm I'm excited. <laughs> great. Well. Let's let's get uh, let's get right into it because we got a lot of ground to cover, and um, I'm just going to toss this question to Siri and Marinda, and I don't care which one of you answer it. I just let's just throw it out there. Um, how do you get started on a season plan? Because I, literally, when I visited you last week, you guys were on week one, and actually, Marinda uh, told me, you know, this is this is week one of the year. So, Siri, when does season planning start? And what, what does it consist of? What, what's the beginning of season planning? Um, I would say for me, the season starts a, the day after Kona. Um, at that point, I want Rennie to just go and have fun and relax and, you know, celebrate, which she does a great job of. 
but for me, I mean, she's so awesome at, at giving feedback after the race, and that's one of the things that we do a great job of. No matter how great the race, there are things that we want to do better. And so always after the race, we'll sit down, we'll discuss, you know, how the race unfolded, how she felt, all the different things that happened throughout the day. And from there, um, I really like to use that time right after the race to start thinking about what we need to work on in this season. So for me, I think having it fresh in my brain is important to really lay out. I like to lay out kind of a tentative vision or a tentative plan for the whole upcoming year. Um, that's obviously going to change, but just writing down the ideas of the things that we want to work on. I mean, Rini and I both feel that she's not yet at her best, and I know she's absolutely awesome, and, and I think she's amazing, but um, there's still room for, for improvement, um, and we need to keep improving because the sport is getting so incredibly competitive. There's so many amazing athletes out there, and obviously we, we want to keep winning. Um, and we can't just rest on our, our laurels and do things the same way we always have. So it's a constant process. But week one, really, as far as being back in person, meeting up for sessions every day, that did start last week when you were here visiting. And um, that's when it gets really exciting um, because we're both kind of stepping up and, and back in action together. And, and that's the part that really gets me excited. Okay. And um... – Marinda, if you could talk about season planning, do you have an A race? Um, what, what's your big race? <laughs> I'm not sure yet. We'll try and figure that out as we go. Um, you know, Siri and I actually, we, we like to sit down uh, usually over a, a glass or two or maybe a bottle or two of, of wine and, and plan out the race season. I like really like to have a solid plan in place. And we basically work back from Kona, obviously. Um, my whole year is based around that race. and. You know, I plug that into October 10th, and then I move back from there. Um, I need to have probably anywhere between, you know, four and six weeks um, <clears throat> between my last race and Kona. So then we plug in a race there, and then it kind of just goes back um, from Kona. The other, you know, the other big, you know, um, races that we plug in throughout the year really a secondary to Kona, they're all important. Every race we line up for is important because it's a marker. Um, I come away from a race, we sit down again, we, we call it, I call it debriefing. <laughs> After the race, we'll go through what went wrong, what went great, what felt good, what I felt that I needed to work on, and <clears throat> or were there any weaknesses that uh, we really need to work on in the next training block. And I also use you know, those training blocks as stepping stones. So obviously right now we're in um, base season or, you know, really just starting back. So I probably, you know, won't race till the end of March. Um, I haven't announced my race schedule yet, so I can't really announce it here. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm allowed. <laughs> um, I'll uh, you know, I'll race. It'll be great for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, yeah, I don't know. My manager's got it, that locked down pretty good. So we'll, we'll wait to announce, um, you know, the races that I'll be doing. But, yeah, typically we'll, we'll have, you know, first race of the year. But, um, you know, that race will be March or April. And then, you know, May I'm hitting another race and then go back and do sort of five to six week training blocks between each race. Um, and then each training block I'm trying to step up my fitness all the way through to Kona. So I'm really not trying to peak in June or July, but usually by June or July we're in really great shape and we're really just about to head into that last big Kona block. But I need to be physically strong enough and able to um, – tackle that um, July training block, July-August training block. So you sort of spend the whole year trying to get fit enough to handle the uh, July or Kona block and then get into, you know, that Kona block and hopefully nail it. And, and if, you know, you can nail it, then you know you're in good shape for Kona. And that's kind of how we've um, lined up the season. So it's worked out pretty well the last few years. <laughs> and and just, just out of curiosity, do you have different objectives on each race or is there – is it always just to, to win, or do you have a, a different objective process uh, versus outcome? How do, you, how do you divide up the objective for those races and um, how that informs your training? Um, well, I think every, 
every, well, every single race I think I'm lining up for, I'm, I'm trying to win. But having said that, you know, that outcome doesn't always happen and you can take positives from losing. And honestly, seasons where I've had maybe rougher starts of the year, I generally tend to be more motivated or focused through my training um, and that bodes well for the end of the year. But, you know, we set the year out for success um, and, you know, try to do my best at every step of the way, knowing that I'm not going to be really in my physical best until, you know, October. And Siri, how do you manage that in terms of the train up and the taper for each race? Because um, obviously, once a competitor gets on the line, they want to win, but the training block might not have set them up for optimal performance based on your your season plan. How do you how do you plan that? Well, the great thing about Rini is, you know, we have a very clear vision of what's most important to us. And just like she said, I mean, every time she steps to the line, she's going to race to win, but we know where we want to be at at certain times of the year, and it definitely is kind of like a, a staircase up with, you know, the final step being Kona. Um, Rini, together we, with the communication, the way we work together, we discuss, you know, what we're looking to get out of each race, and if we look at last year, you know, Roth was such an amazing experience for, for Rini to take part in, and, and she had an awesome race there, and I like to keep it really low-key, like, um, you know, we're going to race Roth, we're going to do the best that we can, no big expectations. Um, I kind of knew that she was going to have an amazing race, but she didn't really know that, <laughs> and... I'm not, I didn't tell her that I thought she was going to have an amazing race because I didn't want to put that pressure on her, but we really just wanted to go out, or at least, you know, we had discussed that, you know, to really manage the bike ride, the 180K, and, and race it in a way where we can really get a sense of where she was at on the bike at that point in time. Um, so for us, I think that was an important part of racing Roth was, was seeing if we could execute that plan and have it go as well as we hoped it, it would. Um, but yeah, with Rini, uh, she's very unique because um, I think a lot of athletes out there uh, don't take having one huge race that is the be-all, end-all. You know, that's too much pressure and it's too much expectation, and I think that can really be detrimental to an athlete. Um, but we've become so accustomed to having, you know, Kona is what's most important to us, and um, every race is is very important to us obviously and we want to show up and do a great job but each race is an opportunity to kind of see where she's at uh, find out what's working seeing if we need to change anything and being able to tweak our training uh, depending on how things go in those races so um, it's really kind of a means to an end um, yet we fully embrace and and go after each race that well, I'd say we. I'm not the one out there racing. I sit on oh, my butt and you're with do her. my thing. But <laughs> but she goes out and you know obviously races as hard as she can. But we're we're definitely out there with a purpose in each race and and hopefully filling up her her you know bank of confidence uh, in time for Kona. Um, but I I would say a big thing in regards to being ready for Kona is you don't want to at any point really close to Kona, and I would say close means like within two and a half, three months, dig so deep and reach so high that you have kind of, you know, drained the well. And um, that's why I like to keep the expectations kind of, you know, low and just say, go out, do the best that you can, because when it comes to Kona, I mean, that's the hardest race in the world. And she's going to have to dig deeper than she ever has before. And, and I think it's not only the physical training that, that needs to be done as perfectly as possible, but it's also making sure that you have enough energy and mental energy and the strength to get through those incredibly difficult moments that she's going to face in Kona. So how, how do you prevent someone from going to the well who's so competitive like, like Rennie? Um. <laughs> Just by, I guess, managing expectations, but really with Rini, she's so great at doing that on her own. And um, But I, I think together, you know, we sit down and we say, this is what we want to get out of this race. And, you know, you're in great form. Um, you're not going to feel like you feel going into Kona, but you can go out there, you know, 
do all the little things right and and focus on the moment and, and doing the best that you can and as long as you manage your expectations um, and for instance in Roth you know on the marathon uh, she was chipping away at, at Rachel Joyce's lead and once she caught Rachel um, it was important for her to know kind of where she was was Rachel falling back or was she staying with her um, and being able to dial it back a bit knowing that she was safe, she was going to win the race, and didn't need to, you know, crush out a, a 250 marathon, but she could just have a steady, really strong marathon to win the race. So it's also your, your strategy in a race, you have to be smart, and you have to, you know, understand that there are certain times in the year where you're going for that world record, or you're going for your fastest race, but there's going to be other races where, for Rini, obviously she's a winner, she wants to win, you know, every race she lines up for. And there are certain times in the year where the goal is you do whatever it takes to win, um, but don't do any more than that. Um, save it for October. Okay. Rini, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the other um, important thing that Siri's maybe leaving out a little bit is um, the way she prepares her athletes for uh, races. Uh, I mean, for for Roth or um, any race during the season, I mean, we're not crushing ourselves into the race and we're taking the time to make sure we recover properly out of the race. And I think that that's um, huge. I mean, as you said, yeah, you know, if you have to crush yourself to win a race three months out from Kona, um, it, it might leave a mark and you don't want that uh, leading into Kona. But um, it would be different doing a half or anything shorter than an Ironman, but I think if you're looking at Ironman races, you know, three months out, you have to be a little bit careful, but I think what Siri's very good at is making sure athletes are rested going into the race so that they're not already taxed from training, and so when they do line up on the day and put out that effort, it's not on top of a crazy workload, um, and that's hard to really do because, um, you know, you're wanting to train up to the day, and uh, for me, I ended up doing you know a race two weeks before Roth, so I really couldn't do a bunch of training. I did a half two weeks before, and then I did the bike at Atlantic City three weeks out. So I was kind of in a heavy race um, phase, and so that didn't allow me to do a bunch of training because I was having to sort of race and recover, and that get put me into a really good position leading into Roth because I really had no time to do a training block. So I was kind of just recovering from a race, you know, sharpening up, freshening up, and then tapering again. Uh, and that, you know, enabled me to race fresh. Um, and then, you know, after off, I, I took a week off, and I'm quite happy to take a week off. And I, I have the confidence in our program that, um, you know, taking a week off, you know, a couple of times a, a year it only helps me. And take that time off seriously. I don't do anything. Typically my husband and I go up into the mountains or on a, on a holiday and don't bring our bike, don't bring our running shoes and don't go swimming. So um, it's an important um, factor in, in the way we prepare for races outside of, outside of Kona, just making sure you're not you know, digging a hole outside of the race itself. Okay. And Siri, I, I just really um, I'm, I'm impressed by um, how you're able to actually get athletes to follow your instructions because I, I think most athletes most athletes I've seen um, it's it's hard for them to follow their coach when their coach says back off. How do you convince people uh, to do that? Um, you know, sometimes you have to let them learn the hard way. If I tell an athlete two or three times how they should do something and if they refuse to do it they're going to get end up getting injured or getting exhausted and that's horrible and I actually don't like doing that because I just I don't want my athletes injured I don't want my athletes overtrained so really the ones that don't listen they just don't last very long and I say that you know it's it's um, it makes me sad because I want to help everyone that comes but you know Rini and I it's so easy to do things properly and I think what athletes are afraid to do sometimes when they have a coach is, is to ask the why of, of why we're doing something and what is this session, what's the reason for this and why do you want me to take a rest for a week, explain it to me and 
I'm quite happy to explain the why of every single session because I'm proud of the fact that there is a, a purpose and a reason for every session. And, you know, Rennie is so amazing at just, you know, giving feedback and communicating all the time. And, and granted, you know, we've been together a long, long time and, and probably in the beginning we weren't as good at it as we are now. But, um, you know, you just learn. You've got to, if you've got a question or you're not believing in something or if, if Rini doesn't believe in something that I'm asking her to do, she's going to ask, well, why am I doing this? And then we'll discuss it. And so really it's just giving them the facts, um, explaining it to them in a way that makes sense. And then they're going to start following the instructions, you know, to a T and, and then they're going to start getting the great results. And, you know, then you have that trust. But in the beginning, any athlete that has a new coach, you kind of have to give them a little bit of blind trust and, and take that risk. And, um, once you start getting the results and you can kind of feel comfortable in, in trusting what they're giving you. But the feedback from Rini has been essential in our success and, and definitely has led to us both trusting one another. I know that she's going to be doing the right thing all the time, and she knows that I'm going to be giving her training that's going to work and that's going to bring out the best in her. So um, the communication and feedback and trust, and if – you're not going to follow your coach's instruction. You shouldn't have a coach and write your own plan and see how well that works and, and then come back and, and ask for a coach. Yeah. Well, I, I think you bring up a great point, and, and a lot of, most triathletes are self-coached, especially in the age group, um, you know, in the age group realm. And you know, I think a lot of them would like a coach, but uh, and when we speak to them before they come to the camp, you know, a majority of the people who come to our camps don't actually have a coach because they, they haven't found the right fit. Um, so I guess what would you what would you tell an athlete looking for a coach to uh, to start looking for, aside from, you know, uh, um, obviously they're all going to want to have you as a coach after this hangout. But, <laughs> not, you know, uh, I don't can, think so, but thank you. Plans, but <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think that the most important thing is, is to understand what their philosophy is. And if that feels like a good fit to you, that's a good sign. And then going deeper. And, and I think the biggest thing is that, um, especially for age groupers, you need to find a coach that's willing to really make a program for you specifically that, that, um, can adapt to your, your family responsibilities and your work schedule and everything and making sure that you're getting what you want. And if you're not getting what you want, knowing that if you ask for it, that they'll be willing to give it to you. Um, and I don't really know how you go about finding that, but I would say that the first thing and the most important is just, you know, don't just go to a coach because, you know, you've heard their name spoken of all the time, but make sure that you agree with their philosophies and that, you know, they bring out something in you that makes you feel like, oh my God, like I really want to do this and I want to do this right and I want to follow the plan and I'm inspired and motivated and this is going to be great because you have to have that passion for it. And if you're not feeling that, I mean, it's kind of like a relationship, really. If you're not feeling that, that this is something that's going to bring out the best in you and that's going to inspire you every day and something that you can believe in, then that's not the right person for you. Yeah. Well, and the thing I'm so impressed just watching you and, and Marinda it, work together is just that that uh, communication and the way you both speak about each other, you know, when you're not with each other and then the way you interact when you're there is, is pretty amazing. So um, I guess the, the, the takeaway there for, for those of you watching is uh, find a coach that, um, you know, you'd, you'd want to have a good platonic relationship with that you can communicate with. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I, I get some chuckles there, but I guess you guys are, uh... <laughs> no, I mean, that's definitely, that's, that's so important. And, and most importantly, it's gotta be someone that you can trust and that you feel comfortable with. Um, I'd say my biggest pet peeve as a coach is if an athlete has an issue with, with a training session or, or they're don't understand why we're doing something, but they don't say anything about it. Um, because, you know, when you sign on a coach, um, I mean, at least for me, like, I want to be the best coach in the world for you. And sometimes I may not think of something that you need. But if you tell me that you need it, I'll be like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry I wasn't giving that to you. Let me, let me give that to you now. 
Um, so really, the communication not only allows the athlete to be the best that they can be, but allows the coach to be the best that they can be. And believe me, um, you know, people that do this as a full-time job, you know, for me, it's my passion, it's my obsession, it's my destiny, it's my everything. And um, when an athlete, you know, Rinny's dream is my dream. You know, she has something that she wants to accomplish, and that's her, like, dream in life. Well, that's my dream in life then, too. Um, and there are a lot of co coaches out there that I'm sure share that same feeling as me, and um, it's just finding the one that's meant for you. Mm -hmm. And, and you're lucky because you get to have 15 dreams on your squad, and, and I, I can see how vested you are in all of them. Yeah, it's, it's, I feel very, very blessed, seriously. It's, it's pretty awesome. I feel very lucky. Yeah. Well, uh, Siri, I'd, I'd really like to um, move on to the, the training plan that you do to, to execute these dreams. Um, you, you strike me when we spoke as a very detailed planner, so talk about once you lay out the, the framework of, of the season with the races and the objective of each races, how do you plan it out? Because I think there's different schools of thought in coaching about how far to plan out and in what detail. Um, well, like Rini said, we'll get together kind of uh, usually in November, <clears throat> sit down over some wine, come up with the race schedule. Um, that's that's the key. And then, of course, as I said, the debrief after Kona every year um, gives me an idea of, of what direction I feel we need to take as far as what we need to improve and, and what we need to be focusing on. Um, but So after our meeting, when Rini lays out the races that she wants to do and, and we discuss how that's going to work and if we need to change anything, then I will get on my computer and write out literally a plan all the way through to Kona. Um, and it's kind of ridiculous because it ends up changing completely. Um, but I need to have that because I need to be able to see in my head kind of where we're going to be at certain times of the year and where we're headed. And it doesn't change immensely, but, you know, obviously, if you want to do things as perfectly as possible, I mean, really, I'll send Rini a, a week plan um, every Sunday. Um, and she knows that we may very well, um, it may look totally different by the end of the week, or um, we may nail it. And um, one thing's not better than the other. It's just responding, seeing how she's reacting to the training, how she's responding to it, and, and tweaking it accordingly. Um, but yeah, I think it's important for the coach to have a long-term vision to have a sense of where you want to be at certain times of the year. And again, that all corresponds to the races that Rini chooses um, on her race plan. Um, scheduling in recovery is, is huge. Um, again, you know, maintaining the athlete's motivation, um, <coughs> letting their body recover and rejuvenate um, is so, so important. So we put together basically a big block now um, leading into a race probably at the end of March or, or early April. Um, Rennie will know and we'll both know at that point that going into that race, you know, she's not going to be at her best, but she's going to be fit. She's going to be getting strong. We will have had a big training block and we'll just kind of see where we're at, have a recovery after that, um, come back and do some races in May. Same thing. You're kind of building up each block of training um, you're kind of reaching a whole new level. Um, and then as you recover from the races, um, you're rejuvenated again, you're fired up to again, you know, step up to the plate and take it again to the next level. Um, so for us, it's kind of a successive, you know, a really good block of training, some races, recovery, and then stepping up again and doing that again. Um, but as far as day-to-day -day and week-to-week, -week, you have to be flexible um, and I think that, Rini, you might agree with this, like in the beginning, um, I think you had a harder time with me changing things. It was like, no, you know, it's on the schedule that I have to do this. And, um, you know, she kind of had to get comfortable with the fact that you can't get married to what's written on a piece of paper because um, sometimes, you know, you may not have slept well because you celebrated your friend's birthday or whatever and you're going to have to change your training around and it's always for the best you've got to do what is the best possible thing to do on that day and and the best part of 
about being in person with Rini every day is that we can make those last minute decisions. You know, she can hop in the pool and do an 800 warm up, and I'll take one look at her and be like, oh my God, Rini, we're going to just swim a thousand and then get in the hot tub and go home and sleep the rest of the day. Or I may have an easy swim on the schedule and see that she looks, you know, pretty spunky in there, and, and suddenly I'll change my session and have her smash out a hard, you know, 4K swim session. So you've got to be flexible and you have to know that um, if you have a coach or, or if you're making that decision yourself, you know, trust in that and know that. Um, and then obviously when you do make a change on that day, you then have to adjust the days, um, you know, coming up. Um, but be flexible. Don't get married to a piece of paper. Um, listen to your body. Um, and trust your gut. If your gut's telling you you need a rest, take it and don't feel bad about it. It's actually the stronger thing to do is to take that rest um, and to give your, your body a chance to recover. That's, that's really hard for the typical triathlete personality. To, <laughs> to <take it> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, talk about that, Rennie. How, how do you, how have you adjusted to this? Um, you know, going from uh, just going hard all the time to to actually being flexible and trusting in in your your body. Well, I think uh, Siri and I had a ch uh, turning point. I started working with Siri in '05, um, in 2006, and I was very much married to the program that was written. I was very um, I, I probably didn't communicate with her as as nowhere near as well as I do now, but I probably didn't communicate with her well at all back in sort of '05 or '06. And um, during that year, I was racing a bunch, uh, training super hard. Um, I never complain, you know, never, you know, I'm Australian. You don't tell anyone if you're hurting <laughs> or if you're struggling or if you're sick or if you can't because it's not sort of in our vocabulary. But um, I got really sick. I got a, like a crazy gastro bug, the worst I've ever had. And um, I, I didn't really let Siri know how bad it was and kind of jump back into training and basically overtrain myself because I was sort of trying to recover from an illness and still uh, continue to do that workload that I had, you know, that we had planned out. So um, that basically ruined my 2000, end of my 2006 season. I had some terrible races late that year when early in the year I was, you know, racing the best I ever had. So... We went away from that and really looked at how we set up the year. And from that, we've basically used that uh, model from then till now. So 07 through till present day, we basically sit down at the end of the year. We map out the season. We have, um, you know, a, a proper off season. I have, you know, at the end of the year, I have a couple of weeks off. I have, um, you know, a couple of weeks of just get moving, do whatever you want. And then I get onto a more... Um, uh, or a schedule or a, a, a training program, but it's still very flexible. Um, and so that really is almost two months worth of not really training like a triathlete. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get moving again, but I'm not really a triathlete. And I think um, that's invaluable for longevity in the sport. I mean, this is you know, my 15th year um, being a triathlete, and I, I still love it. I'm still inspired. I still have goals. And I think... Um, when I first, when we first sat down, um, I knew that Ironman and long course would be where my talent would lie, and that was my passion. But I also knew that the best in the world were mid 30s, and I was sort of early 20s at that time. So I wanted to make sure that I was loving what I was doing. I was looking after my body, and making the right decisions along the way. Um, and so, basically, at the end of '06, we sat down for the first time. We mapped out the season, and and that meant. Um, mapping out the year into three blocks. We have uh, the early season uh, where we come off our real big break, our Christmas break, hit a couple of races, um, usually take a, a week off in May, and I also, or, then I hit my mid-season block of training and racing, and then I take another week off in July. And for me, my body's pretty like uh, bulletproof, I want to say. I mean, I've not had an injury in my career, yeah, touch wood. Um, <laughs> I had I just an injury in my career. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, we've been smart about, I mean, I've got the best coach in the world who, who is always watching over my shoulder, making sure I'm not doing too much. But um, 
for me, it's more having that mental break throughout the year. Um, the week off in in May, you know, you take your five days off, and the first day you're like, yeah, this is great. Second day you're like, yeah, this is this is fun. Third day you're like, I, I want to go for a run, <laughs> but I don't allow myself to. So you're you're coming back from that little break. I mean, five days off or seven days off, you know, the first couple of days back you feel a little rusty, but then you really don't lose anything. And I I gain so much from those little breaks and. So that's kind of the model we've worked on uh, from then until now. And um, going back to day to day, um, not being married to the program anymore, I think for us it's just been trust, trust in Siri and knowing that, I mean, we'll, I'll argue with her sometimes when I'll come to training, especially in my Kona block, because I really, <laughs> I know like what I need to do um, to get to Kona, but so does Siri. And, and when you're super tired and you're training 35 hours a week, you, you don't think as rationally as when you're fresher. So for me to have Siri on the outside, being able to look at me and be like, you'd be crazy, just stop. You're, you're not training today or you need to take a day off. I mean, sometimes we do have arguments, but I know that I trust her and I know that she'll get me to Kona in the best possible shape and um, she hasn't been wrong yet, but I still sometimes like to, <laughs> <laughs> like to fight her on a couple of sessions. Keep it fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> Keep her on a toes. <laughs> well, well, Siri, um, this brings me back to an, an age grouper doesn't have the advantage of having you sitting and working over their shoulder and um, doesn't necessarily have 15 years in sport at the world-class level. Um, so, and, and you know, Seton, Seton and I have spoke many times about uh, the tools that are available now to triathletes, the, the quantified self-movement, uh, not just in triathlon but in all areas of life, is it's big, it's growing, and, and there's a lot of people into measuring everything that they do. Um, how do you use measurement tools like power and heart rate and, and cadence and all that stuff without losing touch with that or without, le without letting those tools inhibit you getting in touch with your body? Because... We had a really interesting conversation where you told me that Rinda actually doesn't rely on that much. She's really just old school RPE. So talk about that relationship there. Um, well, I think the best thing was that when we started working together, um, when I started, I was completely just all about rate of perceived exertion. And, and Rinny was good with that. And she has such a keen sense of um, the kind of effort she's putting out, I mean, she's exhibited that in Kona, you know, being able to push just hard enough, but knowing that she's going to have that little bit extra in the last, you know, 5 to 10K. Um, and that's the reason why I love perceived exertion as, as the greatest tool to use, because I think, um, number one, you don't put ceilings above you. I think a lot of times with numbers, whether you're using power or heart rate, you're, you're kind of setting up a limit for yourself and you're, you're putting a ceiling over what you're capable of. And as we progress through the season, I mean, Rennie's going to be getting faster. She's going to be pushing more watts on the bike. And um, as long as she's putting out the effort that she knows she needs to be putting in in whatever sessions we're doing, um, we know that we're going to be getting out of that session what we're looking for. Um, but then we started, um, we, Rini, I don't know, do you remember the first time you got that power meter that I, like, crushed under my foot because I hated it so much? <laughs> you remember? That was back when I, I was still in the AIS. I believe that was the first, that was um, 06, that was the year we, I kind of overdid it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I blame the power like meter. No, <laughs> yeah. um, no, and I was a little, I remember I was a little skeptical, but I thought, you know, we're going to give it a try because Winnie was really interested in, in giving it a go. And um, what we both learned through that is that it can really mess with your head. Um, and I think that that's why I will never have it as a tool that we use every single session, every single day, because I think um, those numbers just take total control over you and um, you know Rini could be in amazing shape but just have a bad few days and, and have you know maybe be coming out of a, a kind of extra fatigue and, and not hitting the numbers she wanted at that point in time and it was just really messing with her confidence so I just wanted to take that thing and throw it in the garbage disposal I hated it 
Um, <laughs> so we got rid of it. We got back to doing the perceived exertion. And then, you know, we both wanted to get back into it because it really is an exceptional tool. And, and just to kind of as an aside when you're saying if an athlete doesn't have a coach, I mean, that is your best way to determine how you're responding to the training, um, whether you're fatigue, like too fatigued to carry on, you need to have a break. I mean, that's where the power meter or heart rate monitor, I, I'd say heart rate monitor to a lesser extent, but the power meter is an exceptional tool for somebody that doesn't have a coach. Um, but we love to use it. I mean, it, it is, it's awesome to give, it's very motivating. Um, we'll use it mostly for, we'll actually use it, she'll use it every single ride, but we cover it up and what we focus mainly on is is cadence. Um, we've kind of found that your best rides are going to come when you're riding at your most efficient, most powerful cadence as much of that time as possible. So that's become another kind of um, thing that we rely on along with perceived exertion. So we'll cover the the power meter and, and when Rini Race is kind of, and she can tell you more about this, you know, we, we cover it up. She's looking at the cadence only and then after the race, we'll sit and look. And it's just amazing to me how, because Rini has such an exceptional sense of, of how hard to go and where she's at on that scale of perceived exertion, her power file, um, I know two years, not this year, but in 2013, was nearly perfect. It was like the most beautiful power file I'd ever seen. And that was completely going off of her just, her feel. Um, and so I think that when you really become good at, at being able to gauge your effort, um, then you add the power meter as a tool, then it becomes really powerful. Um, we will use it in time trial sessions or when we're doing a real hard bike, you know, when she's really looking to hit the big numbers, then we are going to have it staring her in the face and motivating her. Um, but in the same note, if that session's not going very well, we'll turn the screen over um, and just focus on the effort. So, again, I think it's an amazing tool. You can use it in so many awesome ways, but um, just don't get so attached to it that it has total control over your confidence and, and your self-esteem. So Rini, saying, you can... Oh, sorry. Go, go so, Rini, she's saying numbers do lie sometimes. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> um... Well, I mean, they don't, they don't really lie, but um, they can certainly challenge you. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, as Siri said, I think it's also important to realize that on, on race day, you know, I think there are a lot of athletes that are married to the numbers or married to a certain power output that they need to put out. And I think the women's race, you could probably uh, stick to a certain number more closely, but I think, you know, it's becoming more dynamic. And, uh, I mean, for me, you know, I... I race my own race and, and don't really worry too much about what's going on around me. Um, but I think if you're, for example, my husband, Timothy, in the main men's pack of 20 and they're riding at like 350 watts, way above everybody's threshold, and they always do that for the first 40 kilometers, um, and there's yo-yoing and all sorts, uh, I think that that plays with a lot of athletes' heads and um, I think you're better off to just sort of switch it off on race day. And um, Who knows? I mean, maybe the number that you'd predetermined that you'd tested for a month before. I mean, it could be completely different when you properly rest up and properly taper for a big race. So um, I think, you know, we've spent a lot of time uh, training on perceived exertion, and I think I, at this point, just have an internal um, limiter that doesn't allow me to, to ride over a certain amount of watts or over a certain effort um, out there on the bike course. Um, there's just something that's not even conscious that sort of tells me to slow down or slows me down so that I can still run off the bike um, and race the marathon rather than survive the marathon, which is what I believe a lot of athletes still do. So it, would you say that power has helped um, inform and improve your awareness of your body, the way that you use it? Um, I don't know if it's... It, it's more just give, given me information um, as to where I'm at compared to, you know, top level female triathletes um, or male triathletes in terms of watts per kilogram. So, I mean, I sort of just know, um, you know, what the best 
athletes are averaging uh, watts per kilogram for an Ironman or an half, and a high, half Ironman and they sort of know what to aim for. Um, but in terms of giving me more, um, I, I feel that I kind of already knew or I, we already know like what racing hard feels like or what Ironman pace feels like and, and it's more honestly more for us to look at after and say okay well between mile 50 and 60 um, your power dropped okay why did it drop was it mental was it um, fueling you know things like that that we can go back and look and look through how I fueled and um, who I was riding with maybe at that time um, and sort of figure out where that lapse happened and maybe work on that in training moving forward. Okay. Well, we're on to racing now, and uh, I think it's really interesting that you you were telling me that you actually uh, don't even use a watch, um, or or how do you you don't use anything but but the watch? T talk to me about how you let how you let simplicity uh, inform your racing in terms of tracking. Yeah, I mean, I've always liked to, um, you know, for a half and an Ironman, anything over Olympic distance, I'd wear a, a watch, but I don't like to wear a Garmin or a watch that tells me my speed. Um, and I do this mainly because to keep for, for to keep my mind occupied in the longer races. Um, you know, I like to run through the mile markers and then look at my watch and see what mile pace I'm running. So I I'm not looking at it the whole time, but as I run through, you know, each mile, I'm kind of having to calculate, okay, the last mile I went through and this time, this mile, okay, now it's this time, how fast was that last mile? And that, for me, it just keeps me focused um, and it just keeps my mind occupied. And I think in, in races that are super long and super hard, um, there can be pretty dark voices in your head and telling you you can't and it's too hard and so forth and to so stop. And I think uh, if you can keep yourself focused and, um, well, for me, keep my mind engaged, um, I'm less likely to be thinking about how hard it is and more likely to be concentrating on, okay, well, I ran, you know, a 6.10 mile, I want to pick it up or I want to slow it down um, this next mile. So it's just something that I've done, I mean, it's not right, it's not wrong, it's just uh, sort of worked out well for me so far in my career and, and that's just sort of something that I like to do. And, and Siri, um, this goes back to a recurring theme that I hear um, and, and it, maybe you could talk a little bit more about how to train this is um, focusing on the process of the race versus the outcome and, and it's uh, counterintuitive especially in the biggest races but, but why is that so important? Um, well, all of us are, are at our most powerful when we're in the moment. Um, you learn that in yoga. You learn that from watching the Karate Kid. You know, you're in the moment. And when you're focusing exactly on what you're doing in that moment to the best of your ability, you're going to be executing the best way possible. Um, and Rinny's strategy on the run there, you know, it's perfect. She's, she's staying in the moment. She's focusing on the math. She's not thinking about anything else. Um, if you're going into a race, and, and this is every athlete's um, worst nightmare yet, it happens to, to all of us, and that's that we are going into a race thinking, you know, I want to win, or I, wanna, I need to hit the podium, or I need to beat my last time, or whatever it is, when you're fully focusing on that, it just puts so much pressure on you. Um, it takes a lot of the fun out of, of racing and you lose focus on what's important and that's your form and, and being efficient and you know laying out the appropriate effort. Um, so really when you focus on the process and that means you know in every moment of the race, okay, you know, it's the start of the race. You know, I got to keep my feet moving under the water. I want the blood flowing. I'm just going to relax, take deep breaths. The gun goes off, and then you're thinking about every stroke, where you are, sighting. Um, when you're focusing on the process, you're most likely to execute at the best of your ability, focus on the things that matter, um, and have your best result. So my biggest philosophy or, or thing that I will tell my athletes is, you know, you have no control over what anyone else does and you have no control over the outcome you know when you're on the swim in a race 
but you, what you do have control over is your own performance in every moment. And if you can string together as many moments where you're doing the very best that you can, you're going to cross that line happy. And you're going to cross that line having raced your best race. Um, so again, you're most powerful in the moment. You can focus on doing everything right with, to the best of your ability and with your best effort, and that's going to lead to your best result. So focus on the process and never on the outcome. You know, the, the time when you want to focus on the outcome is after you've crossed the line, lifted the tape, and then you can say, oh, I think I just won. And that's awesome. <laughs> or whatever. Or you finish and you say, you know, I just, wow, my God, I can't believe I just had my best time. Um, but really try, and that's extremely difficult. I mean, it's easy for me to say, but, you know, I've been an athlete, and that was my biggest um, Achilles heel was being so focused on the outcome, and I really had to put a lot of work um, into my mental training and, you know, being able to bring myself into the moment and purely focusing on the process and executing to the best of my ability. Yeah. And, and that just, it's an amazing uh, point, Siri, that you brought up is you, can't, you have no control over anything really aside from yourself. And uh, I was speaking to an athlete today who's, who's uh, interested in the camp, and she said something really profound along those lines. She said, the reason I love triathlon, like I'll get depressed if I don't do it for a few days is, you know, because something really, you know, I've had some bad things happen in my life that I had no control over. And triathlon's a place that she goes to to get some sense of control um, to, to get that back. And, and if you, you know, go to triathlon for that, that's pretty amazing because it's just you and your equipment and, and the bike. But then if you get competitive in triathlon, you have to even go further down and just say, well, wait, at this race I have no control even though I'm in a triathlon where you think you have control. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. And, and that, that kind of leads me to the last part where I, I just really want to get – into because you and Rennie have some amazing uh, thoughts about triathlon and life. And so talk a little bit more about how you've seen Siri triathlon kind of change athletes that you've worked with, whether they were champions or just, you know, age groupers or, or elites or whatever they did. Um, how has triathlon kind of helped people that, that you've seen? Oh, I mean, in the most incredible ways. And, and I guess I would, I'd have to start just with my own experience in triathlon. I mean, when I started training and racing triathlons, I was just such an insecure, um, underconfident, like scared human being. And I, but I took on this challenge and it excited me and it inspired me. And I put my heart and soul into becoming the best athlete that I could be. And for me, um, triathlon was really the, the vehicle through which I found myself, my real self, and the one that didn't have to be afraid, and the one that realized that I'm strong and I can achieve things that I think are pretty special if I work hard enough at it. Um, and so that was my experience, and, and that really led me when I started coaching to thinking, you know, when an athlete comes to me, I don't want to just help them achieve their, their race goals. I want to hopefully impact their life in a way where they leave the sport, you know, a stronger person, a happier person, um, whatever that may be, um, because I know that the sport did that for me. Um, and that's a big part of it. And, and that's where I think my approach of, of mind, body, and spirit, you know, um, if you want to have the best experience in this sport, you need to not only focus on, on training properly and, and enjoying racing and staying motivated and inspired, but staying healthy and, you know, keeping your stress to minimum, really taking care of your, uh-oh, I think that's my phone, sorry. Um, that's right. We don't hear it. Taking care of your mind, your body, and your spirit. And, but yeah, I think there's, everybody has a reason for getting involved in the sport and, especially in Ironman, when you go and watch the finish line, you know, in those last couple of hours, you see people just achieving something that they never thought was possible. And that's life changing. And I wouldn't know I've never done an Ironman. And that's why I have such total respect for everyone that's done it. But um, Rini has is the epitome of someone who has such a great balance in this sport. Here she is a multiple world champion, but she is humble 
and authentic and giving and caring and um, knows how to enjoy life and, and take a step back from, you know, the really, the, the intensity of, of being a professional athlete. Um, and you've got to have that balance. Whether you're an age grouper or a world champion, you've got to have good perspective on the fact that life is short. Um, people matter. Um, and at the end of the day, it's not going to be the number of medals hanging on your wall. It's going to be the memories you have and the memories you made with the people around you. Wow. I couldn't, I couldn't, <laughs> put it, it couldn't be put any better. Well, Brenda, <laughs> we, we had a podcast where we talked about goals and um, what big goals have done for you in the sport. And, and, and I, I was really fascinated by what you said about goals and your relationship to them. And what it means when you do and don't achieve them. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we were talking more along the lines of um, giving your best um, and being okay with maybe not reaching a certain goal. Um, and I think, um, you know, as I've moved through my triathlon journey, I've kind of, you know, I've, I've reached some goals and I've failed in some and some. and But that has never deterred me. That's never, I mean... Certainly, I kind of you know you kind of go home lick your wounds and you're disappointed. But um, I was always willing to learn from them. I think you're you know it's been said many times, but your greatest failures are also the where you learn the most and where you grow the most. And um, for me, throughout my career, I think um, I've been willing to put everything on the line. I think I, I I see it in other professional athletes. I see it in other people. They're so scared that their best isn't enough. And so instead of giving their best, they give their 80% or they give their 90%. And then, you know, maybe they succeed, maybe they fail. If they fail, they can walk away and say, well, I didn't give 100%. But then they never know if they could have done something amazing. And so I've always, I, that, and that makes no sense to me. I would rather put in my 100%, my all, and if I fail, then someone else was better than me on the day or someone else did a better job than I did. Um, in preparing and getting ready for that, whatever it is in life. And um, that doesn't mean, though, that I can't be the better one next time or next week or next year or five years down the track. Um, that just means that on that day I didn't have what it took to be the best athlete. Um, and so I think uh, being honest with yourself and giving an honest effort um, just goes such a long way. Um, and... Not having fear that if you lose, I mean, it's it's your body is ever changing and um, circumstances can change. And if you are willing to put your put everything into something, you're 100 percent in all the time. Eventually, you'll get there. Eventually, you will be good enough. And you and I mean, I feel like you know, I'm nothing special. I'm one of six kids. I grew up on a farm in a small town in Brisbane. Um, I think my story is very similar to series in that I was very insecure um, and, and triathlon has given me so much in life but um, I think I've always been willing to put everything on the line and give my 100% and walk away, win, lose or draw and be happy that I'd done that. Be happy that I'd, I'd given my all because, you know, if you, if you give your 80% or you give your 85%, then you never really know how good you are. And um, if you lose, you can always go back and work on it and, and come back, you know, next year or the year after and, and compete again for that world title. But, I, like, I, it drives me crazy when I see athletes that are too, they're afraid of failure. So instead of putting it all on the line, they'll hold back a little bit and, and never have to face a failure. But, I, I mean, again, I think your greatest failures are sometimes your greatest... Um, gifts because they, um, they they show you so much and, and you can learn so much from them and, and take that forward in your life and, and be a better person or be a stronger athlete. Wow, that was a, two powerful life lessons there. I don't know if I want to add too much to that. Um, <laughs> but I'm so <laughs> proud of her. She's so awesome. <laughs> that's, that's my athlete. You, and you know, Siri, what the thing I see talking to you and Marinda is um, – you taught her so much more than just how to win world championships. Hey, she's taught me a lot too. So, well, of course. I mean, <laughs> really, we we 
like like she said in the beginning, we make an amazing team, and and there's so much to learn. Whether you're the coach or the athlete, um, you know, you're going through life together, and and we're taking big risks, and that's something that Rennie and I do do. We take big risks. Um, but like she said, and she said it so beautifully, it gave me goosebumps. I mean, I'm just so damn proud of you, Rennie. But, um, <laughs> you know, you never hold back. She gives 110% everything she does. And, um, you know, when you know that you've done that, um, you can't help but be proud of yourself and have that motivate you uh, for what's to come next. And you will make it happen. I mean, um, I think we're both living proof that, um, when you want something bad enough and you're willing to do everything in your power to make that happen, um, anything is possible. And um, Rennie's, you know, great proof of that. Yeah. Well, S Siri, I, I, was, I spoke about this at, in a little bit more length with, with Rennie on the podcast that we're about to release with her, but um, triathlon's actually not, I mean, it's, it's only a race, and I know even at in Kona, that's that's hard to say about Kona, but it's, it's you know no one's dying. There's nothing big going on. In a, in a, it's a safe place to to practice failure or facing a goal, and you just absolutely lay it all out on the line. And what I learned when I was chasing my triathlon dreams, um, I didn't reach that goal that I wanted. And actually, it took me a while to even admit the goals that I had, which is uh, to be a professional at a late late age when I started, and but going for it and leaving it all out there and saying, okay, well, I know that this is not what I need to do with my life gave me the, the courage to, to step out of um, a much bigger life decision, which was leave, leave my job in the Army and, and go for what I'm doing right now, which is an entrepreneur and, and uh, you know, my passion of, of uh, publishing, which, you know, triathlon research is part of my publishing um, mission in life to to spread great information with the best people in the world in, in a field like you know obviously you and Rennie here, um, so to me and I'm you know people say well you are you a triathlete no I'm a recovering triathlete but I joke about that because it allowed me to to discover so much about my life all the time I spent on the bike thinking and figuring out what do I really want to do because it was really the reason I took up triathlon is I wasn't <clears throat> quite happy with where I was going. Um, and it, it helped me figure out where to go. So if you're not going for Kona and World Championships, um, practice at whatever your level is, going for something big in the sport. That's just what I would encourage everyone to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got to go for it in life. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, life is short, and... Um, you got to just go for it in life. And, and Sam, like you're saying, I mean, you were doing triathlon and, um, you know, you ended up stopping that, but now you're living your dream and you're doing an amazing job at it. And, you know, everything is kind of preparing us for that next step. I feel my time as an athlete, like my destiny wasn't to be a triathlete and, or become a world champion. That time for me, because I made so many mistakes as an athlete, um, was preparing me for what I do now, which I really feel is like why I'm, it's just, it's everything. I just, it's my passion. And my time as an athlete, even though at the time it felt like everything I could ever want and it was my, you know, my life dream, um, it really was just setting me up for what I do now. Um, but yeah, you've got to go for it in life. And the biggest thing I would say is, you know, fears hold everyone back. Um, it's the biggest thing I had to overcome in, in growing up and, and being where I am now. I was so scared of everything. And like Rennie said, you got to not be afraid and you got to just go for it and not be afraid to fail because um, I've failed 10 million times in my life. Rennie, you know, it's not like she goes out and wins everything and it's easy. Like she works so incredibly hard and she goes through some really difficult times just like everyone. Um, and she's going to have races that are extremely tough and difficult and have, you know, emotionally upsetting, whatever, but it only inspires her to come back the next time and do it that much better and make it, you know, a great day. Um, so you got to, and I, I guess the biggest lesson I've learned in life, whether it's through triathlon or just, you know, growing up is that 
sometimes through your worst, most horrible experiences, the greatest things in the world come out of it. Um, and I think when I discovered that when something hard does come up or you go through a hard period in your life, if you look at it as, okay, you know what, this sucks, but it's going to lead me to a much better place and something great is going to come out of this, it just makes it easier to get through that horrible time. Um, and there always is a light at the end of the tunnel. You've just got to believe and never give up. Yeah. Well, we're certainly practicing pain in the triathlon community, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what amazes me about that is people will finish a really long workout and, and, and they'll just they'll go brag about how, how smashed they are physically, right? Um, but then, you know, no one ever says, uh, and I used to tell the cadets this at West Point when I taught them, no I've never seen a cadet get out of the class and say, man, I just failed that test. That was awesome. You know, it's, or I just broke up with my girlfriend. That, this is great, you know. <laughs> um, but if we could learn how to transfer that love of pain from triathlon to the rest of life, you'd, you'd, uh, you'd you know, probably get somewhere with it. And that's, that's a, a big lesson. That's another podcast, I think. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Well, uh, Seton, um, you were very generous to sponsor this um, uh, show for us, and also you're sponsoring the camp with, uh, with Brenda and Siri, and we promised a prize, and unfortunately, uh, you're the one, or fortunately for me, you're the one with all the goodies to give out, so um, what, what gift do you have for, for those who, who stayed with us through this entire uh, podcast, aside from your, uh, your, great, uh, your great studio there? <laughs> well, um, first of all, thanks, 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 thanks for having me on the show. And I, uh, Miranda and Siri, you guys did a great job. Cheers to both you guys. Um, Thank you. you tell me to get some wine, so I feel left out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bring your wine next time. And, and Miranda, before I forget, say hi to Tim for me. Um, I will. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so we um, so we're giving out a twenty dollar gift card to everybody that is on the show tonight. Sam's going to e email it to everybody. Um, so little little uh, expires on Valentine's Day, so get get you or your loved one a little uh, you know widget. Uh, <laughs> apparently not a power reader or a Garmin. <laughs> 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 um, but, Actually, you can, you can get it. See, you just need to know how to how to use it. That's all. Yeah. That's yes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but nice. great job, everybody. And I also want to you know thank Sam. You know, I, I mean, I've been with Sam now. We've been doing stuff together for over a year, and you know, I just want to say, Sam, great job. You know, our first pod, our per first uh, hangout, we probably had 50 people. You know, and now we have 2,000 people. So I think you're doing a great job. Great content. Um, really valuable stuff. And I'm, you know, your camps are great. I'm really looking forward to the camp uh, uh, out there in Boulder. So have a lot of fun. Awesome. Do you want me to say anything else, Sam? Are you still there? <laughs> You're yeah, awesome, yeah. Seat. It looks like Sam, Sam's paused, so I'll take over the show now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Are we wrapping up or are we continuing? I think Sam might have lost his internet connection. But I, I'll, since we're there, I, I'm going to ask you guys a quick question just on gear, Miranda. Do you, do you have a favorite piece of gear that you use? Ah, that's tough. <laughs> How do I? I mean, my bike is probably my favorite favorite toy. Yeah. Um, I don't use too many gadgets or anything. I mean, favorite toy, my earbuds. I, I like to listen to music <laughs> when I'm out running. Um, that's a good question. Maybe I'll have to come back and tweet tweet about that later. I'll tweet to you about that later. But um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I have a a one single favorite. Are we the <laughs> only Siri, ones left? Do you have a favorite? Is Siri still I here? I think so. Oh, she's gone too. Holy mackerel. Hey, everybody. Miranda and I have our own show now. <laughs> yeah. <It's, laughs> we're going to talk about gear for the next little bit. I don't know yeah. what happened to those guys. What's your favorite? Um, you know, um, that's a great question. I don't know. I'm, you know, it's interesting. With the heart rate monitor side of things, I got rid of a uh, – I stopped using when I started racing and training and stuff. I got rid of heart rate monitor a long time ago because I figured – what did it matter? Like I had to go a certain speed, so what did my heart rate matter? I just go on a perceived exertion. Absolutely. Exertion, so. Yeah. Um, I agree. I'm I'm right with you there with perceived exertion, but uh, each to their own. Yeah. So I I don't know what to do here. Uh, Sam's left me in the dark. What are we gonna do? <laughs> okay. I, I know we're supposed to wrap up this show. 
Uh, I want to invite <laughs> everyone to come to Boulder and join Rennie and I because it's really going to be awesome. And we're really excited and looking forward to a great five days. Um, so if you have the opportunity to come, um, I'm sure Rennie agrees, we're, we're ready to step up and, and offer the best experience ever. And, and we can't wait to hopefully meet some of you. Yeah, so real quick, in Boulder, do you have a favorite place you like to ride or run, Miranda? Since we're all, I, I mean, all 2,000 of us are we coming to Boulder. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I don't, well, May, I guess we could run up there. I love to go run up Rollinsville. Um, we don't actually do it that often because we don't um, spend a lot of time at high altitude, and that's up at about 10,000 feet. But there's a beautiful run. Um, it's called Rollins Pass, and it kind of just, um, you know, one or two percent grade on the way out. It's maybe 10 to 12K, probably 12K out, 12K back. Um, and it's um, just stunning. You run kind of along the uh, along this this river and beautiful Rocky Mountains in the in the in the background. And that's one of my favorite places to run. Um, and I, I just like going up. <laughs> I like going up um, Jamestown. We ride up to Jamestown a lot, which is probably only a 50k uh, trip round trip from my house. Uh, but my all-time favorite ride is actually from Boulder out to Loveland and then up um, Big T uh, to Estes Park, so Rocky Mountain National Park, and then along the Peak to Peak Highway down uh, South St. Brain to Lyons. That's probably my, my favorite long ride here. But, I mean, Boulder, we've got so many beautiful – I mean, I can run out my back door and hit some trails. And I mean, I was running this afternoon. It was beautiful, 50, 50 degrees, um, sun shining. Um, the flat irons are stunning year-round. I'm uh, pretty lucky to live where I do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Sam, are you back? <laughs> yeah, I I, uh, I left right at the good moment. I'm sure you guys were, were talking about some great stuff there. Well, <laughs> Siri, um, I wanna I wanna bottle your energy and sell it, but um, I'm <laughs> it's it's yep. just so great to to have you and your passion infectious in this community. But um, we're gonna do about the next best thing we can do for that, which is. Uh, have you host our, our camp, which um, I promised we'd, we'd uh, talk about that um, from, from 5 to 9 May in, in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I think we should definitely get a, a wine vendor for the camp. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> for sure. I know, I know a guy. Okay. Well, put me in touch with him because I think he'll be a hit. Um, but... You know, Siri, we, we had a great uh, meeting, um, and I was I was really just blown away because I, I just spent some time with Jamie Turner in, in Claremont, and um, you know he's got a squad that, that Gwen's on, but uh, I I was just blown away by seeing what you have in Boulder. You put together your own squad, your own you know your your own secret training facility there, and uh, it's the best kept secret there in Boulder, and you just got everything there, and. Um, you know, just just talk a little bit about, first of all, why do you want to do a camp? You, you haven't done one before with Marinda. Why, why are you guys, uh, what's what's the purpose of doing a camp? Um, yeah, we we have never done one, um, but Rennie and I just decided we, we really want to give back. I mean, for me as a coach, I, I coach 15 athletes maximum. I just know that if I had any more than that, I, I just wouldn't be able to do the job that I do. Um, and I know Rini, you know, gets asked millions of questions all the time about, you know, how to go about training and racing and all of that. And so neither of us have really the opportunity to help more people um, at this point in time. And this is just an incredible opportunity for us to give back to the sport that has given us so much. Um, and there's so many amazing people out there. We're both so inspired by every athlete. I mean, it doesn't matter the level. It's just anyone that takes on triathlon and, and you know, it takes a lot of strength. It, it takes a lot of determination and, and a great commitment. And we want to help. We want to share um, a lot of our secrets and, and how we've gotten to where we are. And um, it's just time. We both feel it's, it's time to give back and show our thanks to the sport that's been so awesome to us. Okay. Rennie, uh, your first camp, uh, why now? Yeah, I mean, I think you go through your triathlon career as a professional. You're so focused on racing and, and getting those big results. But then, I mean, you have some – once you start having some success, you start noticing – I mean, you get 
emails and, and questions and, and you realize that you're, you actually are doing more than just a race. I mean, and obviously that's what we would love to think and believe. But, I, you know, I get emails all the time from people who have um, overcome obesity, depression. Um, maybe they've seen me race in Kona. They've seen some of the NBC footage. And, and you know, I, I get emails almost weekly from people who have, you know, um, uh, just last week I had, had a, um, uh, a young woman who ha was suffering from depression, didn't barely leave the house, had some rough things going on um, in her own family life. She saw uh, a race and and started following me and, and that got her inspired to, to do triathlon and, and she started racing and uh, she's now doing her first 70.3 next year and she's never been happier and she's living life again and I think that is so powerful for for me to be able to hear stories like that and know that you know I've touched a person you know I've, I've been able to without even knowing it give something to someone and um, you know I mean as Siri said we get questions all the time and we just don't have the time during the season to really give back or or really show anyone how we get we've gotten to the, the level that we're at now but um, you know this is a great opportunity that came up and was brought to us thanks Sam um, <laughs> thank you <laughs> and, and, and it's given us an opportunity to you know for those who are able have the time and um, are you know have the time and are able to come out to Boulder and, and join us and um, I think you know, anyone that has gets to spend any time with Siri Lindley, honestly, will um, will change your life. It, you know, she's changed. She touched so many people. She's changed so many people's lives for the better. And um, I mean, triathlon itself is a great vehicle for that. So, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, we'd love to be able to t help everyone, but um, I think we're, you know, we'll, we'll help as many as we can this year. And and if it, the the um, if it's a good success, then hopefully we'll be able to do more of these camps and, and um, meet more people in, in the greater triathlon community. Yeah. Well, how do you how do you transform someone in a week, uh, Siri? Because we've only got a week. How are we going to do this? Um, well, first of all, Riddy said the nicest things, but she is not just an inspiration to watch race, but... Um, <clears throat> as far as a champion goes, you know, she's just a champion human being and, and you can learn so much not just about racing and training, but um, she is just the most inspiring person I know. So come for that reason, <laughs> not for me. Um, all right, and, all right. No, no, no. I think no, it's a no mutual pressure. admiration society. Um, but really, um, you know, we just hope that we can inspire people and bring them you know, answers to all their questions and hopefully just give them an added hunger and, and added purpose in, in their training and in their racing. And I don't know how we're going to transform people, but I just hope that we do. I hope that we can have an amazing impact on the people that come to this camp. Rennie and I don't take this lightly at all. Um, we've been looking forward to this. Um, we want to make it amazing um, because, again, you know, it means a lot to us to be able to make an impact and to be able to have people walk away and say, wow, um, that that was amazing and it's going to help me so much. That's what we want. Um, and we're, you know, we, we like to achieve what, what our goals are and so we hope to finish the camp having mm -hmm. had that kind of a positive impact on people. Yeah. Well, and, and the, I think uh, Marinda and, and Siri, one of the biggest, I think, uh, misconceptions about the camp is I'm not good enough to go and, and we've we've actually specifically designed this camp in the middle of a recovery period um, so that it's it's not a it's not a fitness camp uh, you know it, it, unless uh, Marinda breaks serious guidance which she won't we'll probably all beat her on the run in this year, right? <laughs> uh, honestly honestly you, you, honestly it'll be hard to drag me out for you know a <laughs> 10 mile an hour ride on that week. I, as I said, I take my recovery seriously, and um, but yeah, I, I want to be able to engage with everybody, so I will be out doing some bike rides and, and runs with everybody. But um, yeah, but mostly this is informative and trying to uh, give people tips and um, maybe take a look at everybody's form and, and advise um, what we think would help them become better athletes and better people. Yeah, and, and Siri, you know, we talked about this, um, 
you, you're going to basically demonstrate, show the secret behind a, a, a swim, bike, and run workout. Talk a little bit about how you're going to demonstrate that for, for the benefit of the group. Um, well, we have, I'll be running my, my normal sessions in the early mornings. Oh, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that it's exciting for people, or I hope it is, um, to kind of see how Rennie's doing it. Like, actually watch them um, see me executing a session with my athletes. And we've got some tremendous athletes in the squad. And um, if it does anything for them like it does for me, I mean, I stand there. I don't know how these guys do it, but they're just amazing. Every day I feel more passionate than the day before because it's exciting and it's inspiring to see them work so hard. Granted, Rini at that point in time will be in the easy lane doing some drills and taking it easy because she'll be recovering. <laughs> Um, but you'll be able to see kind of, you know, a day in the life of, of a professional triathlete and, you know, uh, again, some great athletes and watch us just in our own environment doing what we do. It's going to be a very authentic experience. Nothing's going to be staged. You're just there watching, watching us go after what we do every day um, and then being able to join together with Rini and I and, and really learn a ton and, Seriously, I mean, you can be a total beginner or you can be a really competitive age grouper or even a pro and, and you're going to feel welcome and at home at this camp because the goal is really to just provide you with an amazing experience and to teach you as much as we can and through sharing our experiences and our stories and our knowledge, um, hopefully even increase your passion for the sport. Um, so yeah, it's going to be awesome, but you're going to get a really clear vision and a very authentic um, picture of, of how we do things on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and, and that's, and I'll just run through the, the list of things that we, we went over. Um, we're going to give everyone testing at the beginning to, to, to assess where they are, go through your athlete intake process, uh, nutrition intake forms, uh, testing your fitness level, testing, you know, filming your run, swim, and bike. Uh, just really ripping apart everything about you and the sport and, and seeing where you stand and then putting it back together again. And, and that's my old Army background, I guess, coming here in, uh, you know, getting everyone through it and then um, teaching you from the ground up uh, with, with Rennie and Siri swim coach, uh, individual attention on your stroke uh, with Eni Jones, uh, individual t attention from uh, Mark Evans, uh, who will be doing a, a, a run station, at the camp, and then also, um, you know, individual attention on your bike, and you'll get to do do the same bike workout that Rennie and her group does, uh, and and series coach will show you. And then here's the best part: spending one-on-one -on -one time, half an hour with with Siri, uh, going over your training plan, and um, that's going to be after she's spoken for four hours to the whole group about how to plan your season, and really what she did in 20 minutes, she's going to talk about in depth, so that you can actually execute your own season plan or, or tweak your season plan, which you should have by that point. Um, and then also some nutrition and, and Siri, you're especially excited about Rennie's core strength workout that you want to show people? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Erin Carson um, has been Rennie's strength coach for a number of years and, and she's amazing and um, she's on the cutting edge of, of some uh, great work that, that Rennie's been doing and um, we look forward to sharing that as well and um, we're really, really happy that Erin has um, offered to be a, a part of the camp and devote her time um, and it's going to be really awesome because I don't think anyone's really um, seeing what Rennie does or, or what we do um, so they'll learn a lot and they'll get a ton out of it so that's going to be a really awesome part of the camp as well. Okay, and then the last part, Seton, I'm bringing you along because you are, uh, the thing I love about Seton the most is he'll tell you not to buy the expensive equipment even though that's his bottom line. Um, and Seton, why do you tell people not to buy the most expensive equipment and shoot yourself in the foot as a business owner? Why do you do that? Well, I mean, I've been in the sport for a long, long time, you know, uh, back before Miranda was born. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I've been in the sport almost 30 years, you know, and so I'm, you know, I'm here. This is a lifestyle I have. Um, I really enjoy the sport, and so, you know, I just want to make sure people, you know, for for age group athletes specifically, you know, I mean, 
and pros for that matter. I mean, it's about being comfortable. You know, it's about if you're not comfortable in whatever you're doing, uh, when you're when you're out there racing, you, your performance is going to come down because uh, your body's not going to be happy. So, um, for me, it's making sure that the athletes have the right gear at the right time where they are in the sport. And so, like you said, I mean, I've I've often turned people away from from products or, or downgraded them, you know, uh, depending on where they are. So, and that's a philosophy we have as a company, and that's how we treat all of our customers. So, yeah, and I love that scene because you're you're in it for the athlete, and then. You just have faith that they'll take care of you in the long run as a business, and I think that's uh, exactly the way I love to see businesses operate, and uh, that's why uh, you're my favorite and only equipment guy in the sport. So, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And and Seton, we'll uh, we're gonna actually send out um, your coupon code. Thank you again for just rewarding everyone for for showing up and uh, you know investing their time and their own education as triathletes. And if, if this is all you watch, we hope this helped. Um, if you want to learn how you can get more, um, you can click on the button below the screen here and sign up for a, a free coaching call with one of the Triathlon Research Camp staff, and I might actually take one of your calls because I'm on the schedule too. And uh, what we do is we, we basically, the reason we're doing it is there's limited spots at the camp, and because Siri and Marimba are just you know, such a special and limited uh, resource in the community, uh, we want to talk to anyone who wants to go to the camp and just make sure that the camp's right for you. It's going to help you reach your goals um, and really answer your questions because it's a, it's a big investment of time and money to come to the camp and you're going to want to you know, answer all your questions about it and we'll go over in detail everything about the camp. Um, so it's a requirement to, to, to speak to us in order to get into the camp. It's not an uh, application process like you're not good enough if you're, if you're not at a certain level. It's just a question of making sure that, that you're a, a real triathlete with real goals in the sport and that we think we can help you. Daddy. Um, and then, then we'll definitely love to offer you a spot to camp. So um, if you're interested, click on the button below. And uh, I'm going to let you, Siri, and Marinda just say the final words and close this out. Go for it, Rennie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, we, you know, we've kind of said it all, uh, or not all of it, but we've given you a glimpse of what Siri and I are like and how we work together, but, um, you know, we'd love to see you at the camp. Um, again, we hope uh, that this is not the only camp we ever run together, but, um, yeah, we'd love to get back, and uh, I think we can really help uh, people reach their goals or certainly put them on the right track to try and try and reach whatever goal they have um, in the sport and otherwise. Well, I'm going to let the world champion end it there. So if you, if you want to join Siri and Marinda, uh, just sign up for a consult with us and uh, have a great evening. And uh, look forward to hearing your comments on the show. Leave them below the, uh, the bar here, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. The most powerful 